Good evening aspirants, welcome to the daily editorial analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today 5th October 2024, displayed here are the editorial articles that we are going to discuss. The first article, Kerala urgently needs to identify risk zone. This article is taken from the newspaper The Hindu and the second article, Feeling the Heat, this article is taken from the newspaper The Indian Express. And before moving into the discussion, there is an important announcement from Shankar IAS Academy. Shankar IAS Academy is pre storming UPSC prelims test series 2025, batch 2 will be starting on 5th October 2024. So, we know that after every year, the prelims are getting tougher. So, join the course and boost your prelims preparation and link for the registration will be given in the description. And now, without much delay, let us get into our newspaper's discussion. Look at this newspaper article. It is taken from Indian Express, feeling the heat. This newspaper article is talking about the importance of temperature fluctuation in predicting the food production and food inflation in India than rainfall and reservoirs. So, we know that the the temperature fluctuation or the rising cases of temperature is a part of climate change, accelerated climate change. And this accelerated climate change has impacted every aspect of human life from food security to social justice. So, here to ensure the welfare and harmony of a society, ensuring food security is very important. Therefore, this article is talking about the importance of temperature fluctuation in calculating or predicting the food inflation and food production in the nation. So, without much delay, let us get into our discussion. First, we will start with the impact of rising temperature on agriculture. So, there is an historical trend that is since 1950s, the rising temperatures they resulted into declining crop yield and increasing food inflation. So, the logic is very simple. For example, the increasing rate of temperature will bring adverse impact in the growth of crop. Therefore, there will be a decline in the crop production and if there is any less supply with a huge demand, then it will automatically lead to increased price. Therefore, the result would be food inflation and the world is witnessing or experiencing this since 1950. And coming to the scientific projections, the scientific studies found that 2.5 to 4.9 degrees Celsius rise in the temperature or in the rise in the average temperature will lead to 41 to 52 percentage fall in the feed production. And if the temperature rises in the same rate, then it will also result into decline of rice production by 32 to 40 percent. And the condition of regions such as sub-Sahara is much severe than this. For example, one degree cell increase in the temperature can even affect 10 to 20 percentage production in climate impact regions like sub-Sahara and uh, Western Africa. Now, we will see a real world ex example or a recent example that is the heat wave phenomena between 2022 to 24 resulted into crop damages, especially sugarcane and vegetables which resulted into inflation, inflation of sugarcane and vegetables. Now, we are going to see the sensitivity of crops to heat that is how the crops are sensitive to heat. So, first is we have to understand most of the vegetables or crops are highly perishable. For example, if the temperature goes up then definitely the crops will be more vulnerable to perishability. Therefore, the studies found that in the last decade due to the temperature, the temperature price correlation of crops has been increased from 20 percentage to 60 percent in last one decade. Coming to the case of durable crops and animal products, the sensitivity for long cycle crops and animal product has, has also increased it from 10 to 45 percentage in the same period. How can we counter this problem? So, we have to understand if you look into the history, we can see many ancient societies have successfully adjusted their crop production or their production, agricultural production in proportion to the changing climate condition. That is how they survive. We can also use the same strategy that is diversification of crops to counter this problem. In the beginning, we discussed that the temperature fluctuation is more suitable in calculating or predicting the food inflation than reservoir or rainfall. So, the, re the reason is very simple because recently due to various government initiatives and steps, we have increased our irrigation system. Therefore, calculating the food production and the food inflation based on temperature will be much suitable than calculating the food inflation based on reservoir level. So, this article is also arguing for the same shift in approach. Now, we are going to see certain steps India has been taken so far to mitigate the changing climate. The first initiative is National Action Plan on Climate Change it was launched on June 30, 2008. The objective is to achieve low carbon and climate resilient development. So, under this National Action Plan on Climate Change, we have eight core sub-schemes or components. The first one is National Solar Mission, which is looking to establish solar roof facilities and uh, solar based power generation. And second, we have National Mission for Enhanced en Energy Efficiency, which is looking to reduce the use of fossil fuel and uh, enhance the ability to produce green electricity. And then we have national mission on sustainable habitat and also we have national water mission. So, recently we had a 
and th under that we also have a national mission for sustaining the himalayan ecosystem because himalaya is very important in ensuring the climate balance of india they prevents the cold wind from the central asia at the same time also ensures water supply to gangetic plains and uh, Indus plain. So, therefore, Himalayan ecosystem is very important for maintaining the climate balance of India. So, this mission, so this mission is essential of this time. And under this mission, several states also has taken important step to ensure the sustainable development and management of Himalayan ecosystem. And sixth, we have national mission for green India. So, it uh, promotes generation of renewable energy at the same time green infrastructure. And then we have national mission for agri sustainable agriculture, which promotes sustainable agricultural practices to reduce emission and uh, better welfare of the farmers. And then we have national mission on strategic knowledge for climate change, which is focusing on innovative practices to mitigate the ongoing accelerated climate change and new climate friendly innovations and development. And the next initiative is nationally determined contribution. So under the nationally determined contribution, India is aiming to reduce 45 percentage GDP emission intensity by 2030 and this nationally determined contribution also aims to generate 50 percentage electricity from non-fuel sources by 2030 and under this nationally determined contribution India is also committed to achieve net zero by 2070. So, you have to note that India is a developing nation. So, we are committed to 2070. Many times in prelims the question has been asked. So, there they will simply change the date. We are not committed to 2050, we are committed to 2070. So, this date is very important. And uh, then we have National Adaptation Fund on Climate Change. It was launched in 2015. The objective of this initiative is to fund state level climate adaptation fund, adaptation projects. And finally, we have the State Action Plan on Climate Change. So, under this, states and the union territories will develop climate plans aligned with the National Action Plan on Climate Change and nationally determined contribution contribution goals for subnational action climate action so in the beginning we discussed the food inflation so the food inflation not only affects the consumers it can also affect the farmers because they are the producers and the, it can also impact the farmers for example if the food prices are going up definitely then the input for agriculture production will also eventually go up therefore stabilizing the inflation is very important to protect the welfare of the farmers so here we are going to see what are the initiatives taken by the government to support the farmers in the scenario of food inflation. First is supply side management that includes stock management, import export regulations and anti hoarding measures. So, this will help to regulate the food inflation in emergency time. And then we have a minimum support price is a key instrument in stabilizing rural income and food prices. So, we know that the minimum support price will give just and fair price for the farmers produ produce. Therefore, the farmers will be able to sell their products even during the time of inflation and they will be also the farmers will be also able to maintain their purchasing power therefore the minimum support price stabilizes their rural income and uh, food prices so we are we discussed the ongoing climate change and its impact on food production so what are the future outlook so that can be classified into short term relief and medium term challenge for example for the last two years that is from 2022 to 23 and even uh, in the beginning of 24, the world was going through the phenomenon of La El, El Nino. But we are expecting a La Nina in the late 2024. And this could reduce the inflation close to RBA's target of 4 percentage by March 2025. So, if El Nino means more rainfall, the temperature will be reversed or will, there will be a relief for some time. Therefore, the food inflation will also expected to fall by 4 percentage by tw March 2025. And but at the same time, we also have a medium term challenges. For example, for example, the La Nina will only provide a short term relief, but the rising temperature will continue to impact the food production and other aspect of productions in the economy. Therefore, the irrigation can help us to mitigate or to manage this problem up to a particular level, but the heat impact will continue. So, we need a sustainable long term measure to counter this problem. So, with this, we are coming to the conclusion for this article's discussion. So, in this article, we discussed the importance of importance of temperature-centric approach in calculating food production and food inflation in the upcoming days. So, with this, we will move to a main question based on this. The question is, describe the major outcomes of 26th session of Conference of Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. What are the commitments made by India in this conference? So, this entire question can be divided into two parts. The first part, we have to describe what are the outcomes of the 26th session of the Conference of Parties. So, 
and what are the commitments made by in India in this conflict. With this idea, try to answer this mains practice question. Actually, this is not a practice question. This was asked in UPSC in the year 2021. So, this is actually a mains question. It's a previous year question. Try to answer it and post it in the comment section. We will review and reply for your answer. Look at this newspaper article taken from Hindu. Urgently needs to identify risk zone. This article is talking about the importance of risk mapping in the light of recent Wynad landslide incident. We know that the catastrophic landslide in Wynad took almost 300 plus innocent lives. And once Kerala was declared, was considered as disaster free, relatively disaster free. But now the Kerala and the Western Ghats is facing frequent natural disasters in the form of flood and landslide. No doubt the development projects, the unplanned use of land and climate change are the key factors behind. So in this background, let us discuss the importance of, of risk mapping from the main's point of view. First, we will start with the basic question, what is risk mapping? Risk mapping is a process of identification, analysis and visualization of hazard prone areas. That means regions with the, which are highly vulnerable to landslide and flood. The process includes data collection on past occurrences of incidents in that region, environmental condition of the region and potential threats. And based on the study, they will prepare a map highlighting the vulnerable zones. For example, regarding the landslide, we have a, a disaster map developed by the departments of science and technology and the Indian remote sensing center. And what is the objective of this risk mapping? The objective of this risk mapping is disaster management through prevention, minimizing loss and better preparedness for disaster and emergency relief. Now we are going to see the importance of risk mapping in Kerala. The first major importance is identifying geographical vulnerability. We know that the western cuts are highly prone to incidents such as landslide, flood and soil erosion due to its steep slope, heavy rainfall and geological formation. Therefore, Risk mapping of this area is very crucial for identifying vulnerable zones and predicting future disasters. For example, the soil of Western Ghats, they are acidic in nature and highly vulnerable to saturation. Therefore, through understanding this, we can assume that this region will be vulnerable to landslide and flash flood. And the next is cl understanding climate change impact. The, ris the risk mapping is very important to understand the climate change impact on a particular region. For example, the current accelerated climate change has intensified rainfall and also increased the frequency and severity of disaster. Therefore, through, therefore, through risk mapping, we can understand how the changing climate is altering the landscape of a region. So, therefore, we can, so we can make the local community prepare for a disaster and third one is risk mapping is also important to understand the development pressure on a particular region for example due to population growth due to the development projects that is construction and deforestation these activities has destabilized regions for example in the case of Vainad uh, the Vainad the Maypadi Grama Panchayat was an important tourist destination therefore it will bring immense pressure on the land as well as the resource in that area. And we have to understand that every region has its own carrying capacity. Once we exceed the carrying capacity due to over exploitation of that region, it will destabilize that region and the net result will be climate disasters such as landslide or flash flood. And here the risk mapping will be very useful in understanding the human activities in a particular region and we can plan a sustainable development according to the risk mapping. The next importance is informed disaster response. That is accurate risk map is very useful in placing early warning system, evacuation routes and disaster response during the time of emergence. And uh, like we said, it will be also useful in land use planning. Therefore, we can reduce the pressure uh, on the land or we can use the land in a more sustainable way. Now we are going to see the challenges in risk mapping. The first major challenge is data availability and that includes lack of availability of precise and high resolution data on soil composition, terrain, rainfall pattern of a region and fault lines in that region. Therefore, many areas are still remaining inaccessible for risk mapping and Western Guards is one of them. And the second major challenge is, challenge is technological gap and this includes limited access to advanced GIS technology and satellite Im imagery. For many in many instances, these technologies are very costly at the same time, they are not affordable for state governments. And at the same time, in many regions, we don't have a complementary infrastructure to support these technologies or measures for continuous monitoring. And the third major challenge is coordination among agencies. For a better risk, risk mapping, we need a strong coordination between government authorities, local authorities and scientific institutions. But often, we experience a delay or gaps in communication between them. And this delays the implementation or continuous monitoring 
of particular region who are which are vulnerable to natural disasters and the next major challenge is lack of community participation the major issue here is the communities which are most affected due to the disasters are not involved in planning or risk management in that region so th this leads to a disconnection between official plans and on the ground realities for example we saw in the case of Wynad, the government already had a plan to relocate the people from the affected region four years back but the plan did not progress because of lack of participation from, from the people's side so therefore we ex in the case of Wynad, we experienced a disconnection between official plan and on ground reality so once the disaster hit that region the even the ground level emergency relief measures and efforts were also faced a lot of difficulties coming to the way forward in this topic we discussed the importance of risk mapping and the challenges associated with the risk map but now we are going to see how we can develop a much comprehensive and enhanced measures to deal with the problems like disasters due to the climate change so first one is preparing a comprehensive mapping that includes creating a robust and digital risk, risk mapping system that includes data from various sources such as satellite images, historical disaster data and uh, geological survey and weather reports. After preparing a comprehensive mapping, the government can allocate a sufficient fund for the implementation. of. And the next one is public awareness and uh, participation. This will resolve the problem of disconnection between the official plan and uh, on ground reality and we can achieve the public participation through awareness campaigns, regular drills and training and this will be also useful during the emergency time. And the next measure can be strengthening early warning systems and this includes developing a real time system and use of digital platforms for rapid information dissemination. This will be very useful during emergency time especially for evacuation. And the last one is adopting international best practices that is learning disaster management plans and strategies from other nations for example in the case of earthquake different nations are adopting technologies from japan for construction and planning in the case of flood even kerala also implemented several disaster preventive steps from netherlands netherlands we have to understand netherlands is a region which is located below the sea level and they are highly prone to natural calamities such as flood but they adopted several technologies to resolve the problem and Kerala is planning to adopt that. So learning the best practices from international level will be very useful in managing the disaster. So with this we are coming to the conclusion for the topic risk mapping and based on our discussion try to answer this main practice question. The question is risk mapping in the Western Ghats region is crucial for disaster management and sustainable development. Discuss. So this is a 15 marks question and you have to write around 250 words. So you have to address how the risk mapping is very useful in disaster management and ensuring sustainable development. So with this idea, try to answer this main practice question and post it in the comment section. We will review and reply for that. So with this, we are coming to the conclusion for today's newspaper analysis. If you like the video, hit the like button and also give your feedbacks as comments and share this content with your friends and also subscribe to the channel before leaving and also hit the bell icon to receive on-time updates. We'll meet again. Thank you. Have a nice day.